The big question this week is, what colour is the North? A little while ago, I made a programme about rock, about building stones, and when it had gone out, I got a letter from a lady called Claire, who said she'd enjoyed it. Clearly a woman of taste and discrimination. And she sent me some photos that she'd taken of walls, and she said that if I wanted to see some really beautiful rock, I should come to Copeland in North Northumberland. It's been my experience never to risk disobeying a strong woman, so here I am, beside one of the most satisfying walls that I can remember seeing. Before canals or trains made transport easy, all buildings had to be made of materials that could be found locally. In this part of Northumberland, the word found is quite appropriate, because, as you can see from the shape of these stones, most of a wall like this is made up of random rubble, just picked up from local riverbeds or wherever it was lying, barely shaped at all and built in rough rows or courses. They all came, these stones came originally, from those hills over there. Those are the Cheviot Hills, and they were made by volcanoes of various sorts over tens of millions of years. First of all, there were dramatic lava flows that spread thousands of feet thick over the landscape. Then there was a huge mass of molten granite-type rock that lurked just beneath the surface and gradually cooled, and there were dikes and fissures and lacoliths that oozed out all different sorts of rock with different chemical compositions and textures, some of it almost as smooth as glass, some of it coarse and crystalline. Even though these are all volcanic or igneous rocks, there's just so much variety of geology to be found in a wall like that. And as you can see also, it's fabulously varied in colour. It's a very colourful place, the north. Copeland Castle is the big house in this area. At its heart is a 16th century tower house, traditional near the Scottish border, which now has a more peaceful use as a holiday home. As you can see, it's built in the same traditional way, of beautifully coloured random rubble as the farm. But there's more. There's also another natural colour. This is render covering the stone, lime mixed with sand and small stones, bits of shell sometime, stuff. Up here it's called harl, or harling, and it's here for added protection, of course, to stop rain getting in between roughly made walls. People have been using lime render like this for centuries, thousands of years probably. The Romans used it to cover the Roman wall and it's probably always been here at Copeland. But you know, I love it. I love its naturalness and I love its faded beigey colour. I love the way the stones beneath peep through. It feels ancient and satisfying, local. That is a lovely wall. So thank you, Claire, the letter writer, for pointing me in this exceedingly colourful direction. Here's a little challenge. The North is really lucky with its building stone, but if you can think of a more satisfying use of natural colour than that, you'll get, I don't know what you'll get, a pat on the back or a nice warm, smug feeling, but we can but try. Here's a sequence of buildings made of the local stone of the North. Fingers on buzzers. If you see something beautiful, press. This is the village of Downham, high in the Lancashire Pennines, and it's built of two sorts of rock. There's the rock it stands on, which is limestone, and there's the rock from the surrounding hills, which is a sort of carboniferous sandstone called millstone grit. Lots of the buildings use both sorts of stone. Limestone for the walls, sandstone for the door and window surrounds. You would call both of them buff-coloured, I suppose, which doesn't sound very exciting somehow, does it? Buff-coloured. 
vaguely brownish. It sounds dull, doesn't it? But oh no, it isn't. It's just right. These buildings look as if they just oozed out of the surrounding rock. But here's another thing, brown and green. Do you think you'd be likely to decorate your living room brown and green? And yet, what a perfect combination. The brown of the stone, the green of the hills. Buff, but beautiful. This is Lanacost, just a few miles from Carlisle, where I grew up, and just a few miles from Northumberland, where I've spent the rest of my life. And the buildings here, as you can see, are not buff-coloured at all. They would be if I moved just a couple of miles east over the border into Northumberland, but these stones are called New Red Sandstones, and Cumberland, outside of the Lake District, is mainly a red county. This was the stone that made me interested in architecture because I grew up thinking that all stone was red. So when I went away to college in Durham, I was shocked to see brown buildings. And on me halls, I yearned to come home and see red stone again because that was my heritage. Like the colour of the Carlisle buses and the local football strip, the colour of the stones was part of what I was. And even now, I find it really hard to resist. Nothing ever changes, you know. People have always been dirty great show-offs and wanted to go one stage better than their neighbours. If everybody else had local sandstone, there's always one who wants to go one better and bring in faraway stone in wondrous colours, presumably at wondrously extra cost. This is Newcastle's a rather splendid civic centre built in the 1960s. It was the town's first new public building for many years, and they wanted to make a bit of a statement with it. It is, as you can see, gleaming white, and that's because it's not built of local sandstone, but has been clad with Portland stone, which comes from the Isle of Portland beside Portsmouth, which is about as far as you can get from Newcastle in England. It's a sort of limestone. If you look carefully at it, you'll see that it's covered with tiny fragments of fossilised shells. It's naturally white, in fact, exceptionally white, and ever since Christopher Wren decided to use it for St Paul's Cathedral, it has been the stone of choice for public buildings looking for a bit of extra oomph, or even for private owners who wanted to make a bit of a splash. And nobody wanted to make more of a splash than the Lancaster industrialist Lord Ashton, who in 1906 wanted a memorial for his wife, which is nice of course, you can't criticise him for that, and it's difficult to criticise him for what he built either, or at least for what his architect John Belcher built. John Belcher, now there's a name. I bet his life was hell at school. No wonder he put up big buildings to make up for it. And this is big. The Ashton Memorial on the outskirts of Lancaster, the grandest monument in the whole of Britain, except possibly the Albert Memorial or Nelson's Column, and all in Portland stone, of course. No commonplace local pebbles for a project so grandiloquent. Would that have looked as impressive if it wasn't shinily and expensively white? Mm? I think not. All over our towns and cities, after the invention of the railways made transport a bit more possible and economical, special stone in exotic colours was imported for the poshest buildings. In the first half of the 19th century, for example, Liverpool was entirely built of local sandstone. All of its posh buildings, and very splendid they are, are made of local stuff. But after the arrival of the railways, everything changed. For example, two of the three graces on the pierhead, the Cunard building and the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board building were built of Portland stone, gleaming whitely in an important sort of way, while the third, the Liver building, was built of imported granite, less gleamy but shiny and impressive. There's no granite to be found in the ground anywhere near Liverpool. This is imported colour. All of these have been examples of using colour as a form of status. But colour was also a matter of taste, and Liverpool, like many of our towns and cities, became a very colourful place in Victorian times. The 
Victorians, how shall I put it, like things a bit fancy. They're like curly bits on their buildings and on their furniture, and they developed a taste for colour. I'm talking about architectural colour, not just paint, but using different sorts of stone to create jigsaws and patterns, kaleidoscopes of colour. It's an approach known as polychromy. They pinched the idea from the medieval buildings of Italy, and they took it sometimes to extraordinary lengths. I thought you might like to see some pictures of my daddy who died in 1953 when I was a little boy. This is him in the boys brigade, he was an officer in the BB. But this is him in the army, I don't think he ever achieved any sort of rank in the army because we Grundies tend not to get promoted. This is him with bare knees and unsuitable shorts and this is him in overalls painting a house because yes, he was a painter and decorator, and his offices and his workshops were just up here. I broke all the windows in his workshops once by throwing stones at them. It seemed like a good idea at the time, since you ask. Another time I got into the back of his van and covered myself in green paint from head to foot, including my hair. I had to be bathed in turpentine to get myself clean. I believe that it's because of this that I've never liked paint since and have tended to leave the decorating to those who are more qualified than I am myself. Or to put it another way, my wife. Or possibly it's because of this that I've always liked the colour that people apply to the outside of buildings. Some parts of the North have always liked it bare, naked, naked rock that is, but other places have traditionally painted the outside of their houses in bright colours. In Northumberland, for example, there are hardly any painted houses, but in the Lake District there aren't many that aren't. This is Little Langdale, deep in the heart of the hills, where the colour they usually used was white if you can call that a colour, and equally traditionally the material that they used, the painty stuff, was lime wash. I think we need a little sideways leap to find out what lime wash is. Lime is really the chemical calcium hydroxide which for thousands of years people have got by burning limestone in lime kilns. Most of the stuff they got out of the kilns was spread onto the land to make the soil more fertile. I just don't understand how anybody ever discovered things like this. Apparently people have been using lime in various ways for 10,000 years or more. 10,000! It's a good job I was never a primitive man. The human race would never have discovered anything. Anyway, when you've burnt limestone, you're left with quicklime, which is very, very caustic, burny stuff, very unstable, likely to go off in a vapour at any moment. It seems quite dangerous to me. You probably know people with exactly the same qualities. But when you add water to it, it makes slaked lime, or lime putty it's sometimes called, which you can use as a render or a mortar. But if you want to use it as a wall covering, as a paint, you've got to water it down even more until it gets to be a sort of milky consistency, maybe more like double cream, which you can then brush onto your house. It tends to last four or five years, maybe as much as ten if you don't mind it getting discoloured a bit. So that's what they used here in Little Langdale and the rest of the Lake District and the result is, as you can see, immensely pretty and satisfying against the green and the grey of the hills. It's not entirely clear how long they've been doing it. I call it a traditional practice just now, but I don't think they've been painting the outside like this forever. Really old houses don't seem to show any sign of being lime washed. But they've certainly been doing it for the last couple of hundred years at least, probably more, and for the last hundred and fifty they've been keen to make sure that the houses are as white as possible. Why did they do it? Well, it's not totally clear. Partly for protection, of course. It's pretty waterproof, so it gives a bit of extra protection in a damp climate. But it also breathes, and it allows vapour back out, so that any damp doesn't get trapped in the wall behind it. 
It didn't matter as much if the farm buildings got a bit damp so they didn't get lime washed. It's one of the classic things about Lake District farms. The white of the houses, the grey of the barns. But that suggests that it's never just been a protection thing, but a showy-offy thing as well. People white, animals, who cares? My house, super white. The neighbours, pathetic. I love white, but it's certainly not the only colour used. White was more common in the countryside, but towns and villages, seaside villages in particular, can have quite a selection of colour. Nowadays, of course, most of the colour in places like Stades here is exterior wall paint, but in the past they used to dye the lime wash with other colours. They used all sorts of things, damson juice for example, plum juice turned the lime wash pink in much the same way as I use assorted fruit juices nowadays to stay in the front of my shirts and very effective it can be. Deeper reds could be made by adding a sort of red sandstone called rudstone which ladies used to gather from riverbeds and sell in local markets. And there were other natural minerals which gave pale blues and even oranges. It can all be very gay and jolly. But just occasionally you come across something which is A, not quite as jolly, and B, not quite as common. This is Hartlepool, or at least an exposed part of Hartlepool known as the Headland, or if you mean more properly local, the Hoof. It's very difficult to say that without spitting on the camera. This is where the town started, way back in Anglo-Saxon times, much the oldest part of town. There's a wonderful 13th century church and medieval town walls, and as you can see, all the normal associated trimmings of brightly painted houses. But Hartlepool is the only place I know where you also find this used on houses. Pitch, tar, tarry stuff, thick, black, viscous stuff. As I said before, this is a headland sticking out into the sea, thoroughly exposed to the worst of the elements, and I imagine that this stuff offers almost perfect weatherproofing. Hartlepool is a port, and it was a shipbuilding town, so its people would have known how useful pitch can be. It works on the bodies of ships, after all, and keeps the sea out, so presumably it keeps the rain out here. I like that. I'm not saying it's unique, because I'd soon get proved wrong if I did, but it's a local peculiarity, and I like those. County Durham has another local colour peculiarity which I like and it's to be found in Teesdale. Now Durham isn't one of the paint the outsidey sort of places, on the whole they go in for natural stone and brick, but you can't come to Teesdale without being aware that huge numbers of the farms, but not all, are painted white. In the Lake District, as we saw, this happens for practical weatherproofing reasons. But in Teesdale, it's because vast areas of the valley belong to the splendid Raby Castle, home at one time to the Dukes of Cleveland. Now, I suspect that you can't get to be a Duke and own something as vast as this without becoming a touch, how shall I put it, dictatorial. The story goes that uh, one day one of the dukes was out hunting when he got caught in a storm. So he went to what he thought was one of his cottages and demanded shelter. 
Wrong house, not one of his. He got heaved out on his ear and it clearly rankled. So he insisted that from that day forth all of his properties be painted white. That's a scabby and a bossy reason if it's true, but the effect is nice, so perhaps we can forgive him. And finally, a moan. Colours that we do not like. Number one, grey. Number two, three and four, grey again. Not all grey buildings, of course. Some greys can be wonderful. The steely grey of metal, the shiny grey of an aluminium skin under a leaden sky. Bad to beat. Like glass, grey metal can reflect the colours of the sky and become as fascinating and changeable as a chameleon. No complaint about that. But old concrete, old dead concrete that reflects nothing but sadness, there's no pleasure in that. Not when there are so many other beautiful colours that you can choose instead. You will have realised that I've only just scratched the surface of the range and palette of colours available in northern buildings. And then there's brick. I haven't even given brick a proper mention. There's everything from the rich polychromy of Victorian brick to the warm, natural earth-based colours of traditional handmade bricks. There are almost as many different colours of brick as there are of building stones. Do you know, I was amazed to find out that computers these days can show 16,777,216 colours. I wonder how many we've seen in this programme.